both performance critical and everything critical. Uh, okay, at the same time, uh, in the past few months, there have been some unwelcome news. And I should just mention here, there was a fatal accident by Tesla, uh, which drove into a safety barrier. It is not quite known why this happened, but it is possible that there were white lines, which it didn't see, and it veered according to the white lines. Uh, the other example is, of course, the uh, Uber, the fatal uh, Uber accident. In that case, the LiDAR actually did detect an object and recognized it as a pedestrian with a bike. The reason that nothing happened is because the safety uh, uh, emergency braking was switched off, and this is part of the procedure of over testing. So I mention this because, of course, many people think, well, but how can this happen? You know, we've trained it. It has 99.9% .9 accuracy. And I mean, of course, in your community, you know perfectly well what that means. But in my community, we actually prove theorems to guarantee that this is 99.9%. .9 I mean, we know that in machine learning, this is taken, computed over a finite set from an infinite set uh, under the assumption that uh, the distribution follows the input distribution. But do the engineers know that? Okay, so these examples have uh, become motivating examples uh, for what I'm doing. So I'm uh, looking at safety or robustness and the question i'm asking is really should we worry about safety i've given you an example of uber where okay we should be worried about safety but in that case we can't implicate the deep learning so that safety is a much much bigger problem and it needs to be engineered you know system safe system need to be engineered uh, but what I'm giving you an example uh, here of is uh, uh, the Nexa challenge. The Nexa challenge was a challenge where there were a lot of dashboard images taken of urban scenes. And the challenge was to design a neural network that would classify them into there is a traffic light and what kind of traffic light or there isn't a traffic light. And I'm giving you some real examples but found with our software where you take something that classifies as a red traffic light you change one pixel in it to green and it changes the classification of course i don't need to explain what this would mean you know it happens yes you might say well this is artificial these are you know, really digital, digital manipulations. But again, I'm trying to be a little bit provocative here and dramatize it just to make my point. But what I'm concerned about is can we verify, that is, can we prove, uh, but I'm going to prove using an algorithm, so using a, a computer, that such behavior does not occur. Uh, I can show you a few more examples. So what you see there is some uh, traffic signs, the German um, benchmark. Uh, you see some blobs, okay, on them. Uh, but the scary thing is that sometimes these are the serial examples and the really scary ones. Uh, you can you, you get you get them with higher confidence. Again, you know, I was giving this talk and I was making my excuses uh, and okay, you went to some meshes talk. I was saying, yes, these are really artificial. They probably won't matter because they are really digital attacks. So, you know, someone in adversary would have to hijack the uh, uh, channel in order to uh, attack them. Uh, but then someone told me, actually, if you go to Alaska, they shoot at the traffic signs, okay? So, um, yeah.
it's true. <laughs> uh, so uh, we do need to consider physical attacks. I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to tell you about the methods that I have been applying, but my methods are agnostic. I'll give you a problem definition and what we have been trying uh, to do in order to, as I say, verify that deep learning systems behave correctly. Uh, so what I will tell you about is progress in the past two years uh, where I have been developing uh, different techniques to actually provide provable guarantees of safety, but I've been focusing on classification decisions. And classification decisions invariably take me to image sets because there are a lot of networks and a lot of benchmarks that I can compare to. I might be working on LIDAR next, but to start with, it's better to test the technology on something uh, where you can uh, uh, you know, uh, evaluate it easily. Um, now, I will focus also on a very simple property, local robustness, which I will explain, and I will tell you about my efforts in automated verification, which are based on search, in particular Monte Carlo tree search. I also have a game-based technique. Uh, we have used global optimization. We also have a method for Testing, which gives a different type of a guarantee, it gives a coverage guarantee, not the guarantee on output. And finally, at last, in two years, I have managed to get back to where I wanted to, where I've been working and where I wanted to get to, and that is probabilistic verification. Uh, so I will finish with that. Okay, so what I want to talk about, as I said, is a very simple property. And that property is known as point points or local robustness. So I'm focusing uh, on a particular input and I'm considering a neighborhood around that input. Uh, and imagine that there is a decision, critical decision that depends on this. You then want to make sure that the support region of that decision you know, the classification, that decision is invariant over that region. Uh, so for this work, what I'm doing is I'm assuming that I have a trained network. I fix the weights, okay? I have a trained network and it's a classification network. Someone gives me the diameter and of course it has to be chosen carefully because it has to be small. Uh, it can't be too large because you might end up with overlapping classes. And someone also tells me which norm. But in fact, I've been working with all norms, including LC. And then I define uh, safety as invariance of that decision over that region. So this is formally, there does not exist a point, that red point, where the classification is different. And this is a simplified notion. In fact, in our first paper, what we defined is safety with respect to a family of manipulations. And if you think back to what Samesh was talking about, this is precisely what we are asking. And you might think of having a group of operations, uh, but this is just an abstract notion. And in all the examples that I've worked with, we've simply worked with pixel manipulations. But that's not the intention. The intention is to have these semantic manipulations, like in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, so safety verification. Now, um, in my area, what we tried to do is we want to prove theorems about computer programs, and here I want to prove that the computer program, which is the you know, deep neural network, actually does what it's supposed to do. And that means I want to rule out the existence of adversarial examples in that region. But it's an infinite region, of course, and high dimensional space. So I can't do it with an algorithm unless I actually discretize and make additional assumptions so that I can have a finite search. Uh, but of course, for something like images, you know that you can always go down to the level of pixels, okay? 
So this is already you know, a finite search for intractable, but it is a finite search for. And then what I want to produce is a provable guarantee, provable checkable guarantee that that um, uh, decision is safe. That is that there are really no adversarial examples if you haven't found. And for this particular paper, what we do is we reduce to linear arithmetic, which has a decidable procedure and effectively count, count the number of misclassifications. Uh, and this is also done with respect to the manipulations. We use satisfiability modulo theory. And we also, to improve scalability, uh, we propagate verification layer by layer, rather than reducing the whole network to one big constraint verification problem. Now, this is very different from uh, something uh, like um, uh, heuristic search for adversarial examples, any kind of stochastic search, because there, whichever way you search, you can then not deduce that you haven't found anything. So I set up my search and counting so that I can then deduce that there are really no adversarial examples. But in fact, scalability uh, was a killer. And for me, in order to go to something like ImageNet, I had to employ heuristics. And this somehow goes against the grain of me claiming that I'm doing verification. So we have uh, since moved on. And uh, another method uh, that uh, um, we have developed is uh, instead of working at the full dimensionality of images, what we do is we reduce uh, the dimensionality by employing computer vision. Okay, so I've worked with vision problems. I use a very well-known method, SIFT, before deep learning was the best performing method before deep learning took over uh, to extract features. Uh, so it will extract a set of features together with a position and magnitude. Of course, the network also extracts the features in its own way. So what I'm treating it as a moment, at the moment is a black box. I extract the features and I build this intermediate representation as a Gaussian mixture model. And what do I do with this? Well, I then set up a game-based search. So the goal is to find an adversarial example. And what I want to reward is adversarial examples which are as close as possible to the original. So I, that's why the reward is the inverse of the distance to uh, the input. And what I do is I have two players. Player one selects the feature to be manipulated. And then player two, within that feature, will select uh, a pixel to manipulate and then they will alternate. I play the game this way. Now, how does it work? Well, I use the magnitude to weight, okay, the probability. So I target the most salient features first. So I'm looking for the most important adversarial examples first, okay? Um, and I set up um, a Monte Carlo tree search to explore the game tree and as I said the method is, is black box but you can also work with a uh, gray box uh, and it can you can approximate the maximum safe radius. Now how does it work? So if you think of the tree, so alpha is now the input and this is the root of the tree. Uh, I invite, if you want it to work at the level of the full dimensionality you will then be looking at all the possible pixels, but because I've worked with SIFT, all I'm considering is just the features, okay? So player one will select one of these features, and then player two will select pixels within the feature, and that will then expand the tree, if that's a new one that hasn't been found. Uh, and I can then continuously search the tree until you time out, you have to set up some 
time and all the funny the necessary examples. And you will carry on, and of course this is a finite tree that can be searched stochastically. And this is a real example that you find of the digit seven and the well, the you know best, which is the uh, worst adversarial examples that you have found. Now, uh, it, the adversarial examples that you find actually give you an upper bound on the radius of the region around the input. Okay, naturally, it has to be an upper bound. But you, what you want to do is you want to get a more precise region around the input, which on which the classification is invariant. Uh, what we now also do is we employ variants of A star search to compute the lower bound. And for the next example, I'm showing you how I compute using the Monte Carlo tree search, you know, the upper bounds which keep decreasing, and from the bottom you see the lower bound which keeps increasing. Uh, increasing and you have a pretty good approximation of the uh, ranges around the input and of course you see you know the actual uh, uh, images of the digits that have been found along the way. Okay and with this, so this the game based search was used to defeat the next up example they've actually taken it down since uh, and it was shown that you can reduce the accuracy from 95% to 0%. How? Well, I take and I manipulate every single input in the test data set in a very minor way, on average only three pixels, and this takes less than a second to manipulate. Of course, uh, if you were searching through each pixel, that wouldn't be possible but with the game based approaches uh, it's very fast okay um, right but of course that's not <laughs> uh, that's not going to what I haven't told you is that uh, so that method is very good at searching but actually uh, coming up with cast iron guarantees is more difficult so what we have also developed is a method which instead of computing the uh, radius of the region around an input, uh, it looks at a slightly different problem. So I still have my input X and the region, but what I want to do is I want to compute the set of all the possible outputs that the network produces. So I'm showing you an example, and that could be the softmax, okay? the interval of the soft, softmax. If your network is Lipschitz continuous, all the layers are Lipschitz continuous, and in fact all the known layers are Lipschitz continuous, then uh, once you've computed the maximum and the minimum of that interval, all the values are also produced by the network, okay? Um, but so I'm showing you the output as a softmax, but of course you can also consider each of the, the reachable set within the logic layer. There is nothing different in the uh, So this method uses global optimization, and the provable guarantees are well, I can actually prove that the interval is in this case between 0.2 and 0.7, that means that it is impossible, provably impossible to manipulate it, you know, to increase the confidence to say 0.9, okay? That's what that provable guarantee means. And you can also average this over the input distribution so you can compute a kind of uh, global robustness evaluation. How does it work? Well, it uh, uses a global optimization method, uh, uh, which is called an adapt adaptive nested optimization. It doesn't scale beyond tens, okay, or twenties of uh, dimensions, uh, but it will still work at the level of the features. 
Uh, how does it work? As you can see, it uses the Lipschitz constant. So the upper bands are obtained from taking the value of the function. And I use the uh, constant k to compute the lower band. And for the next iteration, I use the scissor function, the subdivision. And you know, you just keep reducing the upper band, increasing the lower band. And the method is any time. So you can stop when your interval has reached a suitable tolerance level. Uh, to show you, as I've mentioned, this doesn't scale to large dimensions for images, but it can work at the level of features. Uh, so here I have an example of a feature, and for that feature I have computed precisely, well, that the lower bound is 74 in the confidence and 99 you know, at the upper bound. Uh, and I can also do a comparison. So uh, here um, there are seven different DNNs, and for each DNN, uh, we have computed the interval of confidence values. And as you can see, number four looks very different. So number four is very hard to manipulate. But the others, they have a very wide confidence interval. If it's nearly zero to one, it's very easy to manipulate. Very easy to manipulate. So there is something in there that needs to be understood better. Now, another method that we have also computed for cases where uh, provable guarantees are just not feasible to, to compute, like for large numbers of dimensions, instead uh, uh, of computing these provable guarantees on outputs, or so say, you know, this softbox uh, interval, uh, what you can do is you can uh, um, uh, ensure some guarantees on coverage. So this is essentially a method that's used for software testing, where we have various types of coverage measures, um, where you know you might want to uh, consider the coverage of uh, you know the different number of if and else's. Of course, in this case, in the case of deep neural networks, we have lots more to choose from because we can uh, consider neuron coverage, neuron boundary coverage, etc. Uh, and I'm showing you that for uh, MNIST and Cypher, of course, there's sort of still like dimensional problems. This works pretty well because you can obtain neuron coverage of nearly 100%. Not quite 100%, nearly 100%. Okay? So I stress this is not a guarantee in the sense of you know, proving that the output is correct. This is only a coverage guarantee that you know you've tested it extensively, you've generated the test, and the chance that you've missed something is just much, much smaller than without doing it. Okay, finally, uh, where I have got to. Uh, well, I mean, as I mentioned, the property that I have considered so far is very, very simple. This is just local robustness. So I have a point, I have a region around the point, and I just want to check that there are no adversarial examples or, you know, no possible manipulations. Um, but this is too strict because, in fact, a deep neural network learns so I have to consider the training uh, data as well. I didn't consider that because I just fixed the weights. So I've assumed that I've trained the network, I've fixed the weights, I've done my verification, okay? But if you have to retrain the network, you have to repeat the verification, okay? So what we are doing instead is we work with Bayesian inference and Gaussian processes 
And in that case, what I can do is I can take a very similar type of region as before, but instead of requiring that there are no adversarial examples in that region, what I want to say is that the probability that there exists one, okay, which is some distance apart from it, is very small. So if you can bound the probability to some small epsilon, you can then say my safety is guaranteed with probability one minus epsilon. Okay, safety for invariant. Now the important, the important aspect here is that this probability is now conditioned on the training data. Okay, it's conditioned on the training. Uh, now this, because I'm using Bayesian inference, uh, you may be thinking about Bayesian deep learning, because in Bayesian deep learning you use Bayesian inference, in fact there are very efficient techniques to compute uncertainty in addition to um, um, computing the output from the network. But this is very different because for Bayesian deep learning, this uncertainty is computed for a point. Here, I'm computing the probability over you know, the, the region. So probability in the, in, uh, over the whole internet set. And I probably don't need to convince you that this is a more principled and a better way to set it up. Uh, and fortunately, uh, it is also possible to compute not the actual uh, probability value, but an upper bound under the condition that we are working with Gaussian processes. Um, and this uh, is something that is well known in Gaussian processes, the Borel TIS inequality. Uh, and from this and some computation of the kernels and solving an optimization problem, uh, because of scalability again, we can only work with small dimensions and therefore we are working with features. The uh, plot there is showing the plot of the probability for different values of de delta. Okay, so that means I'm considering uh, the feature in this input and I'm manipulating the pixels in the feature by no more than the value of delta. Okay? Uh, right, well, so scalability continues to be an issue, but in fact, even though this is a result for GPs, there is an equivalence between Gaussian processes and neural networks, both for fully connected and as of this summer there is also a result for convolution networks uh, from the Cambridge group, Rasmussen from the Cambridge group, uh, but this is true only in the limit of infinitely many neurons. Okay, so this is all I wanted to say and I just uh, wanted to finish off. I hope that uh, uh, I have convinced you that we need to think more critically about uh, deep learning and especially if we are deploying deep learning solutions uh, in safety or security critical uh, systems and I've given you an overview of the methods, almost all the methods that uh, I have developed uh, with my group but of course I can't do everything so Feel free to, to join the band. Thank you.